guys, I am officially back. I've been taking a little bit of time off to go back and forth from Washington to Utah to spend some time with family. I also got a hold of my grandma's police reports from her murder charge back in the 90s, which is a whole other story in itself. So that's been a bit much to handle. I've been having horrifying nightmares, but um, I'll probably be making a video about that soon. But I'm ready to get back into this, and strangely enough, the case that I'm talking about today partially takes place where I grew up, Moxie, Washington. This is the most bizarre missing persons case that I have ever heard of. This is the story of David Glenn Lewis, a missing man from Texas whose case went cold for nearly 11 years. That is until he was finally identified as a John Doe who was mysteriously killed over 1,500 miles away. David Glenn Lewis was just 39 years old at the time he went missing in 1993. He was born in Borger, Texas in 1953 and went on to graduate from Texas Tech University School of Law with a Doctor of Jurisprudence in 1979. After several years of practicing law in Amarillo, Texas, David was elected as a court of law judge in Moore County, Texas, where he worked from 1986 to 1990. And although David loved his job, he lost the bid for re-election, so he began practicing law again in Amarillo. David lived in Dumas, Texas, with his wife Karen and their nine-year-old daughter Lauren. By all accounts, David was a loving and kind man who was a prominent figure in the community. But on the Super Bowl weekend of 1993, something tragic and mysterious happened that would haunt David's family for 11 years. For the Super Bowl in 1993, the Dallas Cowboys were playing the Buffalo Bills. David was reportedly very excited about this as he was known to be a huge Cowboys fan. David's wife and daughter had planned to let David have the entire house to himself as they headed up to Dallas for a weekend-long shopping trip, which was pretty common for them. And just for reference, Dallas is roughly 400 miles away from Amarillo. They left on January 28th and were expecting to return home and be greeted by David, but that was not the case. When the two returned home on the 31st, David was nowhere to be found. The house looked as if he had just stepped out and would be right back. There were two freshly made turkey sandwiches in the fridge, David's watch and wedding ring were sitting on the kitchen counter, and the laundry was still in the dryer. Adding to this, the TV recorder had been set up to record the Super Bowl. There were no signs of a struggle or break-in in the home, so Karen figured that David probably just went to a friend's house to watch the game. But it wasn't until the next day, when David still hadn't returned home and had missed two work appointments, that Karen began to worry. So she ended up reporting him missing to the police on February 1st, and an investigation was launched. Since there were no signs of a struggle in the home, police didn't think that foul play was involved. Investigators found that the TV recorder had been manually set up to record the game, presumably by David, at 5.15 p.m. on the 31st. But the recording had not been stopped after it finished, which left authorities to assume David was not home at that time and had vanished sometime that day. Authorities were able to piece together a timeline of David's last movements, but it left even more questions than answers. Based on his co-workers' reports, David left work at the Buckner, Laura, and Spindle law firm early around noon on the 28th after claiming to not feel well. This was the day that his wife and daughter left for Dallas. That afternoon, his credit card was used to purchase gas for his red Ford Explorer. That evening, David taught a class at Amarillo College, which ended around 10 p.m. So there are a handful of possible sightings of David that weekend that are really strange. On January 29th, a friend of David's reportedly saw him hurrying through the Southwest Airlines terminal at the Amarillo airport without luggage and seeming very anxious. On January 30th, one day later, $5,000 was deposited into David and Karen's joint checking account by an unknown person. And David's neighbors reported seeing his Red Ford Explorer parked at his house that same day. On January 31st, the day David went missing, there were no confirmed sightings of him. But the next day, on February 1st, a sheriff's deputy saw a man strongly resembling David outside the Potter County Courts building in Amarillo taking photos of a Red Ford Explorer. Which is extremely odd because just one day later, on February 2nd, David's Red Ford Explorer was found abandoned outside that same building. Inside the car, authorities found David's ID, his cash and credit credit cards, and the keys to his house and car underneath the floor mat. I did read that it wasn't unusual for David to leave behind his ID in the car, but everything else together is what makes this weird. So back to February 1st, before his car was found, right after the sheriff's deputy possibly saw David outside of the Potter County Courts building, a cab driver came forward and stated that he drove a man also resembling David from a hotel in Amarillo to the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. The cab driver said that the man seemed extremely nervous, paid in cash, and had wads of $100 bills with him. So if 
these sightings really were David, what was he doing? If things weren't already confusing enough, investigators found that there were two plane tickets purchased under David Lewis around the time that he went missing. The first ticket was for January 31st, and it was from Dallas to Amarillo. The second ticket was purchased the next day, February 1st, from Los Angeles to Dallas with a layover in Amarillo. This is extremely odd, as David had already been reported as a missing person by the time the second plane ticket was purchased. But apparently back then, in 1993, it wasn't required to show your ID to purchase a plane ticket. I don't know how true that is, but that's what I read. So if that's the case, it's not really known if it was actually David who purchased those tickets. It also isn't known if those tickets were ever even used. After thoroughly investigating the case, authorities came to the conclusion that David must have just left voluntarily. There were no signs of foul play that they could find, and they viewed it as he was an adult and had every right to voluntarily walk away if he wanted. David's family, on the other hand, thought that this was not even a remote possibility. They felt as if something truly bad had happened to David. According to David's family and friends, David was extremely committed to his work as an attorney and loved his wife and daughter more than anything. He was also heavily involved in the community, so him leaving voluntarily without saying anything just didn't seem likely. David's wife Karen mentioned that David expressed fears in the past that his life was in danger. She felt that this was because of his job. As a former judge and someone who has practiced law for several years, it wasn't unusual for former clients of David's to hold grudges. And depending on the case, that line of work could be considered dangerous. It was also reported that David got several death threats during his career as a judge. It's also worth noting that the week after David mysteriously disappeared, he was supposed to fly to Dallas to testify in a $3 million lawsuit against his former law firm, Ham Irwin, Graham, and Cox. David was very open about his ex-employer's wrongdoings and had no issue voicing that. According to Karen, after David went missing, his files concerning that lawsuit mysteriously vanished too. 11 months in, authorities stopped investigating the disappearance of David Glenn Lewis. From their standpoint, no indication of foul play was found, there were no signs of a struggle, and from what it seemed, David just walked away. Police officially declared him as missing voluntarily, but what they didn't know was that over 1,500 miles away, in the small town of Moxie, Washington, another unsolved mystery was taking place that would somehow tie everything together. In 2003, a Seattle newspaper had printed an investigative series called Without a Trace, which highlighted adult missing person cases, how they were handled by law enforcement, and how these cases slipped through the cracks, often going cold. Washington State Police Detective Patrick Ditter was reading through one of the many articles one day when he realized he wanted to try and bring justice to these cold cases. Patrick decided to research some of the victims within Washington State that have never been identified, which led him to several different missing person databases. He would type in certain characteristics, like the victim's height or weight, and would try to compare them to other missing people. This led him to a John Doe who was struck and killed in Moxie, Washington in a hit-and-run crash in 1993. After digging, Patrick found that this John Doe looked eerily similar to a man who went missing in Amarillo, Texas, David Glenn Lewis. The only difference was that this John Doe was not wearing glasses, and and this was a signature focal point for David as he had poor eyesight and had to wear them 24-7. After looking through the evidence list that was collected, Patrick found that this John Doe did in fact have glasses, although he wasn't wearing them at the time he was killed. They were in his pocket. After contacting the Amarillo Police Department and sending in DNA that had been preserved since 1993, it came back with a match. This man was in fact David Glenn Lewis. But the question remained, why was David in Washington State and how did he end up there? What truly happened to David though wasn't so clear. On February 1st, 1993, at 10.24pm, one day after David was reported missing, a man was seen walking down the middle of Highway 24 near River Road in Moxie, Washington. This is about 10 miles from the Yakima Airport. To put it into perspective, Moxie is a pretty small farming town. It's still considered small today, so I can only assume back in 1993 that it was even less populated. So that stretch of highway leading into Moxie is really desolate, and there's no real reason anybody should be walking on it, let alone at night. A vehicle driving down the highway that night spotted the man walking down the center line of the road. The driver turned around to warn others to watch out, but it was too late. The man had already been struck and killed, and his body laid on the side of the road. He had no identification on him, and his fingerprints were not in the system, and that's exactly how his death and identity remained a mystery for those 11 years. 
It was reported that a Chevy Camaro was seen leaving the scene, but the driver of that vehicle has never been identified. But what's even stranger is that the man, who turned out to be David, was found to be wearing military-style clothing and work boots the night he was killed. According to his wife, those were not David's clothes. He mainly only wore business attire as an attorney, so whose clothes those belong to and how they ended up on David is still a mystery. And upon further testing, no drugs or alcohol were found in his system. Like I mentioned earlier, David had extremely bad eyesight, but that night he wasn't wearing his glasses. They were in his pocket. How would he have been able to see, especially walking down a desolate road in the middle of the night, if he wasn't wearing his glasses? It's also interesting to know that David was calmly walking down the road. He wasn't flagging anyone down for help, and he wasn't distressed. He was just calmly walking down the middle of a highway over 1,500 miles from where he was last seen. That in itself is so bizarre. You'd think if David was in any sort of trouble, he'd try and wave a car down for help. Sadly, whoever killed David is still out there and has never been caught. The questions surrounding David's disappearance and death only continued to pile up. David's family said he had absolutely no ties to Moxie, had no work there, and had never even been to Washington State before. In the months and weeks leading up to his death, he never made mention of having to go there for anything. So why was he in the small town of Moxie? He was killed about 29 hours after he was thought to be at his home watching the Super Bowl game. It would have taken David roughly 23 hours to drive by car to Moxie from Amarillo. But as we know, his car was found abandoned two days after he initially went missing. And at that point, David was already dead. If David flew into Washington, it would have taken him a few hours. But at the time, there were no direct flights to Yakima. And if you recall, the two plane tickets purchased under his name were for two different locations pretty far away. So how David ended up in Moxie in the short amount of time that he did is still unknown. There are a few theories that have surfaced about what could have happened to David. One theory is that he was kidnapped, and David's family believes that this is a strong possibility. But there were no signs of a struggle at David's home, and there were never any sightings of him with another person. He was always alone. And if he was kidnapped, why take him to Washington of all places? Another theory is that David really did just walk away from his life, although his family strongly denies this. David's wife did mention that he feared for his life, so it is possible that he walked away from whatever was scaring him in order to protect his family. And to throw off whoever he thought was coming after him, he did bizarre things, such as leaving work early that day and abandoning his car. It's also a theory that the two plane tickets per just under David's name were red herrings to hopefully mislead anyone who he thought was coming after him. And after walking away, he was tragically killed in an unexpected hit-and-run accident. But even if he did walk away, that still doesn't explain why he was walking down the middle of Highway 24 in military clothing that were not his. And lastly, there is a theory that David was possibly suffering from dissociative amnesia, or was possibly in a dissociative fugue state at the time he went missing. Dissociative fugue presents as sudden, unexpected travel away from one's home with the inability to recall some or all of one's past. This could possibly explain the bizarre behavior and circumstances leading up to his disappearance and, ultimately, his death. Of course, this is all just speculation from over the years, and sadly, none of it can be proven. After David was finally identified 11 years after he went missing, his remains were brought home to Texas for a proper burial. And although it took 11 years, I can only hope that finding David provided at least a little bit of closure for his family. And that is the strange disappearance and death of David Glenn Lewis. I will probably be thinking about this nonstop for the next couple of weeks. If you guys have any case recommendations for me, feel free to leave them in the comments below. I'll see you guys next time, but until then, stay safe.